speaking of God's Word, why don't we talk about why we're celebrating uh, Father's Day is because in scriptures we're instructed to honor our father and mother. That's the fifth commandment of the ten that God gave Moses. And Paul in Ephesians is reiterating this to the church that it's important to honor our fathers and mothers. And there's a reason because it's going to be good for us. Look what it says. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well. You want things to go well with you, students, <laughs> young adults, uh, everyone, Learn to honor your father and mother, and you will have a long life on earth. Well, we have a couple days throughout the calendar year where we actually set aside some special time to honor our fathers and mothers. Today is Father's Day, um, and it's important to do that. Now, I know that uh, in a room this size, there's people that uh, this can be a challenging day because maybe this year you lost your father to eternity or maybe uh, you're unable to be with family during this time. I mean, there's a lot of reasons and sometimes the emotions can be all over the place when we come to these very special days. But uh, I want to help us in learning practically how to honor uh, the men, honor the fathers in our lives and uh, so oftentimes when we come to Father's Day, uh, preachers sometimes take advantage to kind of have a beat down on dads and, and, and uh, husbands because, you know, there's so much room for us to improve, right? Uh, how many men would say, you know, I got a long way to go. I, I raised my hand. I got a long way to go when it comes to being a better husband, being a father. And sometimes uh, we can come to a day like this and feel kind of beat down. Well, today is going to be the opposite because I want to preach a message for dads and to everybody else. All right? So this is, this is going to, uh, uh, happy Father's Day in advance to you fathers. This is a message for you. I'm speaking on your behalf so you don't really have to. Well, no, you should speak in the marriage, in the relationship. Uh, I hear it from your wives. My husband never talks, right? Oh, so you should speak, guys. But today in this message, I'm going to speak on your behalf to everyone else. And uh, uh and I, I love this topic because it's so needed to understand how the family structure works and the role of honor. And uh, so what I want to do is I want to give us three things, three actions, three ways that we can demonstrate, we can show our respect and honor to the men in our life and how honor really draws men's hearts towards home. So let me make this overarching statement that I really believe is true, and that's this, that the relationship and the environment or the environment where men feel most competent is what will capture our hearts, our attention, our time, and affection. Now, just sit on this for a moment. The environment or the relationships where we feel competent is what captures our heart. It draws our heart to those kind of relationships and those kind of environments. That's why I work oftentimes for, for many men. We're drawn to that because we feel respected. We're admired there. Somebody is paying us to do a job. I mean, they find value in our contribution to their company or to, to the business. It's a place where maybe we feel we're excelling in our gifts. We feel very competent. So naturally, our heart gravitates. Uh, it grabs our time, our energy, our attention. Not so much at home. Sometimes at home and in those relationships with our spouse or with our kids, oftentimes we don't feel very competent. You know, maybe we didn't have a good role model in front of us or maybe we're just so, you know, focused on work and providing, you know, shelter and food and all those kind of things that we don't really know maybe how to express that in home life. And so sometimes we kind of avoid uh, getting close. Sometimes intimacy can be a problem with men as far as just being close and, and developing those relationships. Um, but wherever we are made to feel competent, and again, that's not really everybody else's job. I mean, I need to bring to the table a, a sense of who I am in Christ. I can't depend on you to make me feel competent. I've got to bring that to the equation. But ladies and and, and students and children here, you can go a long way with creating an environment where your husband wants to be, where your dad wants to be. And so I want to I wanna just suggest three things that we can do. But let me just say another thing here. Even though uh, this may be true, 
And you, you may be kind of mulling that around to see, well, I, I, I think that's true, but you maybe have some exceptions here. Um, th- it's never an excuse. Just because maybe the environment uh, isn't maybe what it should be or the relationship with, you know, my spouse or isn't what it should be. Men, that's never an excuse to sin. It's never an excuse to shirk our responsibilities as, as leader in our home, as provider, okay? But I want to speak to the ladies specifically that, wow, the, the, the power, the influence you have in creating an environment where your husband is drawn to it when they feel competent in the home. I'm telling you, you do these three things. You do these three things, and I guarantee that his heart will change. His heart will be drawn towards home. Now, uh, there's just certain things that, uh, you know, women, you're going to struggle to understand about a man's heart, just like there's things that men, you know, we're going to struggle to understand about women. That's, that's just the way it is. Um, and some of these things that I'm going to suggest, these three things, they may, they may seem simplistic. They may seem silly. But that's just because there's things that you have to learn about us men and we have to learn about you women. Um, now, you may be here today and you're not married. Maybe you're a middle school student, a high school student, or a college student, or a young adult. You're not married yet. Uh, I can't encourage you enough to tune in, pay attention, because in understanding men, in understanding your boyfriend, understanding your sons, understanding your husband, uh, your dad, you'll be way down the road if you can grab a hold of some of these things as you approach relationships, as you approach eventually marriage. So these three things are so important. Now, let me give a little bit of a caution here because I've already seen it happen while I've been speaking for the last five minutes. I've seen some ladies go like this. (laughs) Oh, so you're going to tell us about men, huh? And we're supposed to honor men. And for some of you, that's very hard because you're like, well, if my husband was more honorable, then I could honor him. But see, Pastor Mike, you see him on Sunday, but you don't see the way he treats me. You don't see the way he talks to me at home or when we're in the car. I mean, if he would be more honorable, then I would honor him. And I mean, come on, let's, you know, he just doesn't lead. My husband doesn't lead. I've tried everything I know to get him to lead. I've bought him books with highlighters. I've signed him up for stuff. I've signed us up for stuff, marriage stuff and couple stuff like that. And nothing seems to work. I mean, to his defense, he's a go-getter at work, but he just kind of fizzles out at home. And though there may be some very serious circumstances when it comes to just the idea of honoring men or honoring your husband, um, you know, maybe beyond the scope of what we can really deal with here, I guarantee you do these three things and his heart will change to some degree. Um, So you want to... You want to find out what these three things are? I think you're ready. Now, this first one, now we've got to be careful. This first one, uh, uh, don't laugh, all right? Because, again, some of these sound a little simplistic. Some of them sound simple. But uh, the first one, the first way to capture your man's heart is this. Listen to us. Hey, you didn't write that down. <laughs> I cannot overestimate the power of a woman listening to a man. Women, you don't know the power that you have. And really, it's not just a man thing. It's really an everybody thing because think about it. Who do you listen to? You listen to someone that you think has something important to say. So you listen to them. There's something valuable. There's something significant that they have to say, so you listen. And so when you're in the habit of listening to your husband, you are communicating to him that you have something important to say. You have something that's significant. Maybe I can, I can follow your lead. Listening to us men is something that we long for. We really do. And when you can get in the habit of, of listening to your husband, as, as, as simple as that sound, it can really make a difference. Now, in the Greenville, South Carolina newspaper, there was an article written, uh, and it's entitled, uh, Mistresses Anonymous. It's an, actually a company that was formed, and they would set up... Uh, men with mistresses. And the founder, she writes this, and I won't read the whole thing, but uh, it kind of, again, she's not a Christian, um, but she hits on some things that are really important. She says this, ask any mistress, her man really doesn't do anything but talk endlessly. 
Mistresses are experts in the art of listening. People think that a mistress has some kind of sex manual that keeps men bewitched, but actually what she really has is the capacity to listen. Now, again, some of that it may be garbage, but you know, I think she hits on a point that men long to, long to be heard, long to be listened to. And uh, when we're listened to in the right way, and there's a right way and a wrong way, and we'll talk about that in just in a, in a, in a moment, you're communicating to them that they're competent to lead me, that, that I can trust them, that they're worth, worth listening to. Now, unfortunately, uh, we develop all kinds of bad habits. Sometimes uh, Christian women, you know, develop a bad habit. And I know, ladies, you don't do this intentionally. But you are in the habit of listening to all kinds of men, speakers, preachers, teachers. I mean, you know, a podcast and YouTube and all kinds of, and they're all men speakers. And to you in your mind, it, you know, it's, it's just a, a, another preacher. It's another teacher. But to a man in the heart and mind of it, it's another man. Now, you never once thought about that, ladies, right? Because you're a lady. You're not a man. And you may brag, you know, you may say, oh, honey, you've got to listen to this guy. Oh, he's right on. He's spot on. And again, to you, he's just a teacher or a preacher. But to us, it's another man that you have chosen to give your undivided attention and time and energy to listening and fawning and bragging over. Uh, to us, it's just another man. Now, do we have insecurities? Yes, I mean, absolutely. But I know you never once thought about that. To you, it's just another speaker. To us, it's another man. And it can be threatening to some degree. Again, we have insecurities. But th the point being is that, you know, when you constantly listen to, you know, other, other men, you know, in our hearts, it's like, you know, I have something to say. Do, are you able to give your undivided attention and an un, uninterrupted attention to things that I have to say. See, there's something inside of us that we long to be listened to. So let's talk a little bit about, instead of, you know, constantly having our ideas shot down or uh, being interrupted um, or, you know, you're not nearly as interested in what we have to say as, you know, everybody else. So how, how do we listen? How, what's a good way to listen? Well, let me, let me just be frank and blunt here this morning, ladies. Guess what? It, it, it's really not that he wants your input, okay? <laughs> I, I mean, <laughs> you may have a lot of good input. And I, I Connie, she has such great insight. And to be honest, I, I'll usually maybe kind of be a little bit quiet when she gives an, a, an opinion or idea. I won't write, like, just gobble it up right away. I'll be like, oh, okay, I'll, I'll consider it. I'll, I'll, I'll think about it, right? And half the time, I'm always going back to her and say, you know, honey, you were right. Maybe days later, maybe weeks later. <laughs> um, so it's not that you don't have good input, but the thing is, um, you know, oftentimes what all we want from you is not you to solve the solution or come up with a problem. We want you to appreciate our struggle, and we want you to assure us that we can handle it. Those are the two things we really want from you that you will appreciate our struggle and that you can assure us that, that we have what it takes. I know sometimes when your husband finally does open up, you're like, oh, he's talking. We're going to have an adult conversation. Hallelujah. God still works miracles today. He's opened up. He's talking. And right away you jump in with, you know, honey, and I heard this verse, and, and Pastor Mike said, another man, okay, you know, you need to, have you considered this? You're right there with your input, your opinion, your idea, and that's not what he wanted. He just wants you to appreciate his struggle and to let him know you got what this takes. Connie, oh, she's learned to do this so well. I remember it was several years ago, I was you know, preparing a sermon for Sunday, and I, I, it was probably Thursday or Friday, and man, I, it wasn't coming together at all. I mean, it, Sunday was coming like a freight train. 400 plus people are going to show up on Sunday expect to hear something that they've never heard before. Right. <laughs> okay. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm venting some frustration to her like, oh, this isn't coming together. This isn't make sense. And so Connie's in the other room. She's hearing all this. And so I push away from my computer and, and my Bible and just walk around a little bit, and um, Connie did this so brilliantly. And she just basically said this. She said, you know, Mike, 
you've been preaching so well lately. This new series you're doing, oh my goodness, it's, it's so good. So many people have told me it's so helpful. That's all she said. You know what that did in me? I mean, she could have interpreted that like, you know, I wanted her to pull up a chair next to me and help me do my sermon. I mean, if she would have thought that, I was kind of asking for help, right? But she understood that all I, would, all I wanted was someone to appreciate the struggle and to assure me that, that I can handle it. And she, she did that. So, so she just said, you know, Mike, you've got a good track record. You're doing so well. You know what that did in me? I got back up behind my computer and in, in my nose in my Bible again. I knocked that sermon out because she didn't jump in too quickly with wanting to come in and rescue the day and save the day and, and give me all kinds of input that maybe would have been important, but that's not what I needed. And oftentimes your husband, your, your, your dad's not looking for the solutions. He just wants somebody to appreciate the struggle. And sometimes we jump in too quickly with our solutions. So that's number one. Thing that the first thing you can do to capture your, your husband's heart, to, to capture and to honor it, is to listen to us. Second thing, are you ready? Now, get ready for this one. This is the S word, but it doesn't end with X. Okay? This word ends with T, uh, but it's, uh, it's equally repulsive to many 21st century feminized women. Okay? Is. Uh, is the S word. Preachers are afraid to preach on this word. Um, ladies, and, and our culture has scared us away from this very term. You want to know what the term is? It's submit. The second thing that you can do to honor your man, the heart of the man, is to submit to his leadership. There's the word, submit, right there. Now, granted, this word, this, this idea, this concept has been severely abused especially in the church. It's been misinterpreted. Uh, it's been misapplied in so many different ways. But we can't throw the baby out with the bathwater because biblical submission is not a dirty word. Jesus, the Son of God, the perfect God-man, he submitted his will to the will of the Father. Remember what he said? Not my will, but your will be done. He submitted. You know, what was God's will for his son? That he'd sacrifice his life, that he'd go to the cross. You see, submission isn't about being a doormat. It's not about, you know, not really having an opinion or just not valuing yourself, a low self-image. That's not what it means, not a false humility. No, actually, it's, it's, it's poise, it's confidence, it's knowing who you are in Christ, but choosing consciously to submit your will, your desires, your wants below someone else's. That's what biblical submission is. It's not about being a dominating dictator, you know. And, and here's the deal. You want to see this in Scripture? Just so, you know, you don't get mad at me. It's actually in the Bible. You want to, you want to see what it says? Look what it says. Um, uh, we'll get to that verse. Uh, really, let me just say this while I got it on here. What really that means submitting to our leadership is basically simply allowing us to lead. Does that make a little, you know, kind of a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down? Does that make you feel better, ladies? That it's, it's, you know, because that word submit can really bring up some, some bad stuff. But it's really simply allowing us to lead. That's what it means to submit. So let's see what it says in the Bible. Here it is. Verse 22 of chapter 5. For wives, this means submit. Yes, there it is. You know, guys, you probably have this verse underlined, right? It's highlighted. The pages are yellow. Okay, now ladies, you haven't underlined anything till verse 25 when the, it says what the husbands are supposed to do. Okay, so granted. But, um, so there it is. Like, wow. I mean, honey, it's, it's in black and white. The Bible says, God says, that you are su to submit to me as your husband. And again, this is where we get off because, guys, we go to this verse. We underline this verse, but we fail to underline the verse that comes before this. Look at the verse that comes before this. There's a submit verse. But then it says here, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This isn't just a man thing. This isn't just a woman thing. This is an everyone thing. We're all to submit ourselves to one another. But how this gets off course is, guys, when we demand this from our spouse, but we're not willing to do this first. You go here first. This is what the Bible says. You're supposed to submit. 
I'm in charge here. I'm the leader. <laughs> you know, and you don't do that. This ain't going to work. Okay. That's why it's so important to do this. Jesus laid that example. And it says, submit one to another, not because they deserve it. It doesn't say that. It says out of reverence for Christ. It doesn't say submit because they've really earned, you know, for me to submit to them. They're doing so well. I easily submit. That's not what it says. We're to make a conscious decision to submit, not because they deserve it, but be out of reverence for Christ. And so when we do this first, you know, when, don't demand this before you're willing to hold yourself accountable to do this. When you do this first, then this makes sense. And this is an environment where she is going to want to lead, and she's going to give you the space, create a vacuum to lead. And that's really what submission is, is simply this. It's creating a vacuum, creating space for us to lead. And what happens when you back off emotionally, when you back off in the, in the heat of the moment, when you've got this big thing you want to say or whatever, or, or there's a decision that has to be made, and, and when you back off verbally, emotionally, and you give space, create space, most men will step up, maybe not as fast as you want, but they will step up to lead. But they won't lead if you grab the reins, you grab the rudder, you grab the steering wheel. And some of you ladies, you're so in control, you've got all three. And you ain't letting go. And you wonder why he's not a, a leader in your home. Maybe, just maybe, you have to back off a little bit and create space because any man is going to step up because it's in us to lead. That's part of our DNA. We will. Again, we may not do it as fast as you want us. Our priorities may be out of whack sometimes. We may even lead you in the wrong direction. Not morally, of course, but we may not do make some of the right decisions. But are you willing, you know, to, to let go of the reins? Now, to some of you, that's like asking you not to breathe. I know. <laughs> but, and to refuse to pick them up. And again, some of you, you haven't had maybe a husband to share the responsibilities with you, a single mom, a single parent, hats off to you. You've had to pull up your bootstraps, and you've had to be both as best as you can. And you, you could not afford to, to buckle under the pressure. You've had to be strong. And hats, you're like modern-day heroes. We have a number of you in our church. Uh, hats off to you. It, it's got to be so difficult. But some of you single moms, you're raising young men. You're raising boys. Don't raise a mama's boy by being so strong and being so controlling that you don't seize on certain opportunities to begin to nurture that young man within them. Now, they can't replace your husband. They can't fill the shoes of, of their daddy who's maybe gone. That's not their responsibility. But early on, you can begin to identify some of those things that's in the heart of a, of a young boy, of a young uh, adolescent and begin to nurture that leadership within them. Don't raise a mama's boy where you just take control of everything. Don't, and even as adult women, don't speak for your man. Some of you are in the habit of speaking for your man. You know, create some space. Let some silence happen. It's okay. It's, I know it gets awkward, but don't speak for him. Don't finish stories. And sometimes, you know, we got some bad habits you know, your husband's telling a story, right? And all of a sudden, you, you know, he's telling to a group of friends, and you're like, well, he's like, uh, well, you know, I think, yeah, it was Labor Day last, last year. We were from friends, and you're like, honey, it wasn't Labor Day. It was Fourth of July. Come on, how could you forget? That's our anniversary. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so it was July. And, and we were with, uh, yes, yeah, Stephen and Rachel, and we're, honey, it wasn't Stephen and Rachel. It was, it was Gertrude and Fred. Man, you know, you're getting all the details wrong. Like the details really matter. What you've done is you cut him off at the knees once again and really maybe even humiliated him in public for the moment. Like he's so incompetent, he can't remember the details of this story. Who really cares? And what happens is us, that's why us guys, we go to our cave so quickly. Well, there she goes again. I guess you can tell the story better than I can. And so off to the cave he goes, and, you know, he won't come out again until maybe the dust settles. It's a little quiet out there. And, I mean, I'm, I'm just being real this morning with, and, and guys want to lead. We do, but many times, and it's not all the wife's fault. It, it goes, there's plenty of blame to go around. But this is 
something that y- you probably haven't thought about as wives, as mothers here, about learning and what is going on in the heart of a man. He wants to lead, and we'll only put up with the struggle for so long before we leave. Maybe don't, we don't leave physically, but we'll leave emotionally. And we'll find another place where we feel competent. And oftentimes that's away from the people that we love. Paul is saying create a vacuum, create some space, and your husband will lead because here's the deal. The better follower you are, the better leader we become. The better follower you are, the better leader. You want us to be the spiritual leader. Will you? We can't lead someone who's not even willing to follow. So a way to capture the heart of a man is to learn how to submit. Now, I know some of you are like, well, he won't lead. He won't even make a decision. You know, he, he, he barely talks. You know, I've learned if I don't, it won't. That's just the way it works around here. And ladies, you feel so capable, and you, you probably are, but are you willing to drop the reins and refuse to pick them up, even at the risk of it all crashing and burning momentarily? Give some space, and your man will lead, even though he's an imperfect leader. I'm an imperfect leader. Maybe we, you know, we didn't have the example that, that we needed, and maybe we're going to lead too slow. We may take a few wrong turns, but reminding us time and time again how imperfect and how incompetent we are doesn't made it motivate us to step out and lead. We'd rather hide in our cave and in our shell. So now that I've made you all mad at me, <laughs> let's get to the third one, third and final one, and I'm asked uh, the worship people to come on up and get ready to close our service here. So the third thing, what is the third thing? Oh, my goodness. The third thing is admire us. One way to capture the heart of your man is to learn to admire us. What does admire mean? It means to marvel, to highly esteem. Does, does he feel like that around you? Maybe on Father's Day. How about the other three you know, <laughs> days of the year, huh? We never grow old of admiration it, it's like almost like a drug to us to, to, well to people in general it's not just men but we're drawn to that push that button often we're drawn to that um, there are other people there are other women who will find us admirable at some point you're like huh, I, I, not not him I'm safe <laughs> you couldn't be more wrong she doesn't even have to be that attractive I mean, you've, you've been around people that, guys, they've forsaken their wife and their family, and you look who they're with, and you're like, you gave all that up for her? Are you crazy? That power of admiration is a strong, strong influence in our lives. So let me give you just a quick list of things that really click with us men as far as you want to know how to admire us. Again, these are practical things. I could have talked theory about the importance of honoring your husband, but I wanted it to be practical today. Things you can do. Now, you may not want to do all these things today because, you know, you're going to say, well, Pastor Mike said it's too soon. All right, don't don't do that. Give give us some space here. But here's a list of things that really click that you can admire us about. Our appearance. You know, say once in a while, you look really good today. Now, we're not going to make a big deal of it, you know, but it's a big deal. I, I was at a restaurant this week, and I, some ladies were meeting for lunch, and they came in, and the first thing they said was, oh, you look adorable. That outfit is so cute. When us guys get together, guess what? We don't get together and say, oh, I love that flannel on you. That You look so cute today. We don't hear that from anybody out there unless somebody's trying to admire us with the wrong motives. Okay, so why not from you? You know, you, you look really good today. We're, again, we're not going to make a big deal about it. How about this? Admire our intelligence, how smart we are. You may be smarter than him. Just keep that between you and the Lord, okay? But, you know, hey, honey, man, if you weren't here, I wouldn't have figured that out. Thank you. I never thought about that. That's a good idea. I think we should do that. Admire his competence on the job. Again, I, was, I heard some ladies talking about what their husbands do, and this one lady said, well, 
you know, she couldn't even, she named the company wrong. She couldn't even pronounce the name of the company. And she said, well, my husband, he does something with wires, some, something with wires. You, you know what that says to him? That communicates to him that you spend day in, day out working so hard, and I don't even knew, know what you do. You know, it's not really important what you do. Oh, he does some of the wires. How about acknowledge his competence on the job where he pours his heart and soul into it? How about admiring his physical strength? Oh, we never grow old of that. Even though, guys, come on, let's be honest, we're not as strong as we used to be. I mean, we think we are. I mean, just come out to one of our uh, softball games at, at Celebration. And especially us guys who are over 50, I mean, we still think we can play really good. And uh, I, I remember just a couple weeks ago, I, I got a hit. I mean, I, I've gotten more than one hit this season, but I did get a hit. And, and I'm rounding first. I'm thinking I could get second, maybe even a triple. And I, I round first base, and for no reason, there wasn't a hole on the field. There, I didn't get tripped. I wasn't intentionally sliding into second, some heroic slide into second, face first. I just fell <laughs> flat on my face. And, I mean, in my mind, I was rounding second for a triple. And, and, but I, my body was only rounding first. <laughs> I, know, I know we're not as strong as we used to be. But you can say things like, you know, honey, you unscrewed that lid all by... No, don't say that. Don't say that. No. <laughs> but you can say, like, you know, I, I couldn't got that lid off with you, aren't you, honey? I, I'm glad you're here. Man, there's so many things... You do. You just, you got that strength. Honey, you mean you carried all those groceries in in one trip? Yeah. You know, hey, you're going to be curling those giant bags. <laughs> yeah, look at this. You know, we may not make a big deal about you saying, hey, you know, I appreciate, you know, you doing this. But I guarantee the next time we're in front, in front of a mirror, well, we're going to be flexing. We're going to be flexing. Yeah. So just a few ways to admire. Admire. Um, the, you know, his love for the Lord. That, oh, my goodness, that would be a... Admire, thank you, honey, that you're sitting next to me in church right now. Thank you that you helped get the kids ready today. Thank you that this was a priority today. You know, admire the courage and the character, the positive things. It's Father's Day. Honor that man. Honor your father. Honor your husband. And when you do those things and you push those buttons often, when you uh, just simply listen instead of maybe talking so much, just listen to us once in a while. Appreciate our struggle. Let us know you can do this, honey. I know you can do it. Uh, when you submit to our leadership, you allow us to lead. And when you simply admire us, man, those are things, three things. Our heart just is drawn towards home. It's drawn towards you. And it gives us a better opportunity to make some mistakes along the way as a spiritual leader in the home. But you have a big part of it. Now, you can't change your husband. All you can do is change yourself. But you do some of these things, and you'll begin to see his heart be drawn towards you and to home. Amen? All right. Well, why don't we stand this morning? And men, I'm going to invite you to come forward. Every man, it doesn't mean, even if you're not a father, if you're a young man, you're a student, every man, come stand here. I want to pray a blessing over you. So, Father, we find ourselves at a humble place this morning. We present our lives to you right now. We know we're not perfect. We're far from it. We failed many times. But I thank you, God, for being such a great example to us. And you've provided so many examples of men in your word. Men who failed miserably. We get to read about it. Our story mirrors some of their stories. And we acknowledge that, Lord. Forgive us, God. We want to lead. We want to be the man that you desire us to be. Sometimes we don't know how to get there. Sometimes it's so confusing. Sometimes we get sidetracked. We get thrown a curveball and we strike out time and time again. But Lord, today is a new day. You are a good, good father. Thank you for being a good example. May we look to you 
May we look to your Son to model our lives after Him and His character, to reflect His image, Lord. Teach us how to do that. I pray, Lord, you help us to not live in our caves, to be alone, but to reach out to other men around us, somebody maybe who's just a little bit further down the road that we can find great strength and we can uh, maybe kind of be a spiritual son to them. I pray, Father, that you connect the men of this church with a strong bond that when one of us stumbles, there's somebody there to help, put a helping hand to reach and pick them up and to walk alongside them for a little bit. God, we are desperate for connecting with other men, but also with our wives, with our children, with our families, with at work. So I pray a blessing on these men, Lord. We ask for your help. We ask for your guidance. And we thank you, Lord, that you've brought us this far and that you'll give us the strength to continue on in strength, in power, and in might by your Holy Spirit. One more moment with you today, man. If you're here today, you've never submitted your life to Christ. You've never surrendered. You've, you've never really given it over completely to Him. This is your moment right now. What a better Father's Day to come back home, to surrender your life to Jesus. I don't know who you are. I know many of you, but I don't know all of you. Maybe you're here today. And this is a moment where you say, I need to surrender my life to Jesus right now. I know it. I need it. I need God in my life. Maybe you've been, walked away, and this is a moment for you just to come back and kind of, you know, get settled again in the things of God. Just slip your hand. Just raise it to me, and I want to pray for you this morning. Anybody here? Any men here say, that's me? I need to give my heart to Christ today. I need to come back to Him. I've strayed. I've done my own thing. I've been stubborn. But today is a day I'm humbling myself before the Lord. I trust you've done that. If you want to speak to me afterwards, I'd be happy to share a few moments with you. But, uh, Father, I pray a blessing on these men. Ladies and family and students, would you reach your hand out to maybe your, your man is in a certain area in this auditorium at this altar. I know your hearts are reaching out. Maybe you're wanting more for him than he wants for himself sometimes. Oh, God, hear the cry of moms, wives, daughters, and other sons here, Lord God, hear the cry of our hearts for our man. God, we don't understand the battle that he's facing. We don't understand the opportunities for compromise and breaches in integrity, Lord God. So, Father, I align my faith with his right now. And we pray, God, that your Holy Spirit would help him to guard his heart and guard his mind. And, Lord, that there would be a turnaround and he would be the man of God that you desire him to be. So, Father, bless him now with long life, with energy, with purpose like never before. And we thank you for that. And in Jesus' name, every man said, Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless you, man.